Welcome to the It's Time podcast with your host, Professor Dale Feinauer from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business Graduate Programs. I'm excited to have one of our one of my colleagues with us again today, Michael Patton. I um, want to start with the question of why in the heck did you become an academic? What was the twisted road that got you here? Uh, it, it is indeed twisted. Uh, <laughs> I did spend 25 years in private industry. Uh, but before that, when I was an undergrad, uh, I thought I was going to be a high school social studies teacher. Uh, and my parents were both teachers at one point. My brother's an academic. And I, so, you know, teachers beget teachers like doctors beget doctors and lawyers beget lawyers. Um, so uh, I was going to be a high school social studies teacher. Um, didn't work out for, for myriad reasons. Spent 25 years in private industry. Uh, and then after getting my MBA and MSIS from UW Oshkosh, um, Dr. Ironman reached out to me and said, uh, hey, you want to teach as an adjunct, one class. And so I did that for a little while and enjoyed it. And then when there was a full-time opening, he's like, why don't you come take that? Uh, so I took a little bit of a pay cut to come do this, but uh, you know, teaching is probably what I should have been doing out of the gate and really like doing it. So tell me about the 25 years in private sector. What'd you do? Uh, I was in uh, information systems uh, in a training capacity, in a leadership capacity, in a in a practitioner's capacity. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in political science with minors in history and French. So naturally, I've spent my entire career in IS. Um, sure. It makes sense, doesn't it? Um, uh, if you I, drink enough, I if, guess. If you do drink <laughs> enough, yeah. So uh, we moved up to Wisconsin. And like I said, I was going to be a high school social studies teacher because UW Oshkosh has such a great education program. If you didn't go through... Uh, and get your teaching certification, your education, and do your student teaching, all that sort of stuff out of UW Oshkosh. At the time we moved up here, it was really hard to get a job uh, because you had to have the connections, and I didn't. But my wife's assistant's roommate was working for a systems integrator, and they were looking, uh, this is how old I am, they were looking for someone to teach Word and Excel and how to double click on things. And I had run a computer lab in college, I had a teaching background, and so they figured, you can probably put those things together and be competent enough to do those basic things. Uh, during the course of working there, uh, I was exposed to opportunities to expand my technical knowledge. Uh, and so by the time I left, I was one of the first uh, MSDBAs in the country and uh, had, had really gotten some, some certification and training. MSDBA. Uh, Microsoft Certified Database Administrator. Okay. Um, and so... Um, had, had some theoretical technical knowledge. And then that whole, uh, you know, business to business education model pretty well dried up. Uh, and so I, I needed to actually practice doing what I'd been teaching. Uh, so my, uh, my landlady uh, went over and said, you know, a, a company just downsized all of us educators. And so I'm going to be looking for a job. And she's like, what is it you do again? I said, well, I've been teaching about this really technical stuff, but I'm going to have to do it now. And she's like, oh, I think our company is looking for a new uh, systems administrator. You should apply. So I did. And I started working at Oshkosh Door Company and was the system administrator and later leader of that IT team and uh, got to practice a lot of things I'd been teaching about and implement some new things and, and learn some new things. And so my, my whole career has been kind of a, yeah, I'll try that. <laughs> uh, and, and so now I'm in academia. And you enjoyed it. I love it. And what do you focus on now in academia? Um, I am our network and uh, primary cybersecurity guy. So I'm the director of our relatively new cybersecurity center of excellence. And uh, I, I focus on teaching uh, networking courses, some, some intro to, to IS courses, as well as uh, uh, one of our cybersecurity courses. Cybersecurity. Yeah. Talk to me. What's that? Cybersecurity. Uh, it's basically the process of protecting any or all of your digital assets whether that be from internal threats, external threats, whether that be um, threats that are trying to take things away from you in that very kind of cinematic way of, you know, the hacker uh, in a basement in uh, Bangal Bangalore hacking away in a computer trying to break into your system from the outside, or whether it's uh, 
threats that you actually give them the information through social engineering and and they they trick you into telling them things that you probably shouldn't be doing otherwise. <laughs> uh, so so it's it's any and all of that falls under the umbrella of cybersecurity. Okay. Um, and and you said cybersecurity institute. Uh, Center, Center of Excellence. Center yep. of Excellence. Yep. What is that? Um, so it is uh, uh, an idea that we had that actually came out of, I just wanted to make my networking class more interesting. <laughs> uh, and so I was looking for ways to do that. And a friend of mine said, I know this guy, he's got a mobile cyber warfare range. I'm like, my students would love that. So we, we brought the, the, the guy in to have a conversation about what we could do with this mobile cyber warfare range. And in the course of our discussions, I could tell he had bigger aspirations than just dragging this group of laptops around. Uh, and and I know that there's a need out there for better, just general knowledge of cybersecurity. Uh, so he and I got together. Uh, we had our first meeting in December of 2020. And by spring of or fall of 2021, we had a functional, permanent cybersecurity center of excellence with, with the idea that it was rooted in the Wisconsin idea that we're not just here to teach students, but we're here to be meaningful in the lives of everyday Wisconsinites. So that exists, yes, to supplement what we're doing in the classroom, but also to reach out to businesses and citizens of any size uh, and and expand their cybersecurity competency, whether it's just personal protection, or you know, all the way up to doing some really intense um, ransomware training. Let's say for an organization who wants to, in a safe uh, environment, experience ransomware rather than dealing with it when it actually hits them. <laughs> um, and so, so we can we can train your technology people. We can help you set up. Uh, policies and cultural changes that make you more cyber aware, or we can just come to the Rotary or Kiwanis meeting and, and tell you what we do. Uh, and, and, and any and all of that is, is kind of where we, we live. Now, that, that sounds like a relatively quick, particularly for academic uh, arena time frame, where in, in less than a year, yeah. you went from having a discussion about this thing to having a center of excellence. Yeah. Um, how, how did you lead this thing to make it happen that quickly within academe? Uh, well, A, there was an obvious need for it. So that helps, right? If you know okay. that there's a marketplace, right. that's, that's always good. Second of all, I knew enough of the inner workings of the Byzantine system that is UW Oshkosh <laughs> to know where my pain points were going to be. And, and that if I didn't get those pain points on my side early, this was going to fail. So the very first meeting I had after my meeting with my, my external partner was I went to the people in charge of keeping the rest of the campus network safe, right? I went and talked with Victor Alatori. Sure. And I, and I went and talked with, with the leader of that, that group, uh, Mark. And I said, okay, guys, here's what I'm planning on doing. Uh, here is the support from you that I would like, and here is what we're going to do on top of what you're already doing to make sure that you don't get burned. So the first thing we said was, look, we know our idea is to bring a lot of nasty stuff on campus, so we're going to keep it air-gapped. We are not going to touch the rest of the university system so that should anyone do anything dumb or should anything get loose, it's not going to be in your lap and you're not going to have to deal with it. Okay. Uh, and so, so that sentence right there went a long way. So you built a brick wall between A and B. Yep. And what I'm hearing is fundamentally as a leader, you identified what were reasons why someone might have to say no and tried to construct a sale, a reality that would overcome their resistance. Exactly. Yep. And so... Uh, and, and they could recognize not only the benefit to the greater community, but the benefit to the university of having something like this, because we can help them with their cyber, with educating the rest of the workforce uh, so, so that they don't have to spend their time on those resources. We, would, we, we can take on some of that if, if they want us to. Um, so you identified what obstacle, what reasons they might have for saying no and tried to address them. And then you tried to identify reasons why they would have for saying yes, yes. and tried to highlight them. Yes. So, so after we got them on our side, which I knew if, if they said no at any point in time, this whole thing's dead. 
Okay. Um, so now they're on our side. So then I went to the people who would have to say yes to free up me as a resource. So I went to my chair, I went to the dean, uh, and and talked to them about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do it, and and got them to say yes for all the for all the same reasons. Said, oh, and by the way, I've already got networking on our side. This is not going to be a problem. Right. Um, they recognize the need in the marketplace, and so. Uh, it sounded innovative and cool, and they were all on board for doing it because that could be a differentiator for them in the marketplace. Um, once we got them on board, then we went to the top and said, here's what we want to do. Uh, here, here is why this could be good for the university as a whole. By the way, networking is already on board. By the way, College of Business is already on board uh, and went that way. Uh, and so we, we got buy-in from the chancellor and the provost. E everyone at this point has said yes, almost with, almost without pushback. Uh, the networking people gave us a little pushback because they needed to, right? That's their job. That's the due diligence. Um, but everyone else had started saying yes. Then we came to the part that I knew was going to be our other really big headache, and that is where is this going to be? We need <laughs> physical space for that. Um, and that was an adventure. I had already kind of highlighted something, even though I've only been at the university full-time for about five years. My wife has worked here for over 25 years. So I know I knew a little bit more about the university than, the most, than most people who'd only been here five years did. And I knew there was a space in the basement of, well, not in the basement, on the first floor of Greenhagen that had been used as a data center but isn't being used as a data center right now. So I know it's got the infrastructure. Uh, because it's at Greenhagen, there's parking nearby, which if you're gonna bring in the outside, don't wanna have to wrestle with parking. Is there parking? It had uh, first floor external entrances, right? So they don't have to go into all the other stuff. I'm like, this is the place I want. Now, my external partner looked over at the Culver Center and said, that's a beautiful building. It has parking and external entrances. And wouldn't it be great if we could be over there? I said, that is a new building. We are not getting in that place <laughs> at all. Just put that out of your mind. So said, not high enough up the food chain to get We are not high enough up the food chain to get that place. I said, this is the place we should be aiming at. So that's when I really first started to get pushback. Uh, internal IS was using that space still, although not as a data center. They did have someone working out of there. Uh, in my estimation, was the space underutilized? Yes, but they had a reason for it. And so I had to try and figure out a way to get them on board, whether it was from persuasion or, co or coercion, right? I can either try to convince them to give it up on their own, or I can go above their heads and have someone say, you need to give them that space. Ironically, as I'm trying to decide what is the best way to go in this situation, someone relatively high up in the university with control of certain resources said, I got a room in the Culver Center that's not being used. It's an old phone bank. Uh, it's just sitting there. Do you want to use it for a little bit? So the place that my partner had specified as the place he wanted to be is suddenly available to us. I said, what do I got to do to get it? He said, ask. <laughs> so I did, and that's where we are. Nice. And had that not happened, it wouldn't have been nine months. It would have been far longer. The, 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 the getting that physical space would have been a lot tougher. Um, so yeah, that's how we ended up where we are. Cool. Being a leader in academe, mm -hmm. trying to lead this sort of a thing, cybersecurity uh, center, um, how is that different than the roles you've had in the private sector and trying to lead and do things there? Uh, one is I have significantly less control of my budget. Um, a, uh, I don't have a sales force, so, so generating revenue can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, so I either have to have the re revenue allocated to me through some Byzantine process that I really have very little say in, and we do have some seed money, and that's how we got our startup money. Um, Dean Rao, uh, graciously offered to pay for our internet connection for, I think it was six months. The provost paid for another six months. So our primary expense for the first year is paid for. Um, so that that's the biggest challenge is, is having far less control over that revenue stream and, and all of the politics that go into that revenue stream. I've, I've gone from being you know, someone who sits in on all the board meetings where all those decisions are made about where money gets allocated to being someone who's asking someone who's asking someone who's asking someone who's asking someone for money. 
Uh, and, and that's, that's a significant, uh, change. And on top of all of the, you know, bureaucratic things that go with being a state institution, right? Uh, in, in business, if you want to do something and you could make a business case for it, my experience has been, it generally happens. Uh, now, even if there is a logical business case, et cetera, et cetera, there's all of this other political stuff, both big P and little P that can get in the way, right? We don't want to um, deal with the legislature and, and things that may go on with this. We don't want to upset this other constituency within the organization because of whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and so being part of academia with all of that extra stuff, it, it just moves so much slower. So what's the takeaway in terms of leadership? What have you learned about leadership from being a leader in both environments? And now a short break to let some of the folks from the College of Business talk about various programs and services that the College of Business provides. Thank you. The Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh is focused on solving tomorrow's problems today. Corporations and other businesses in Northeast Wisconsin can utilize the center for threat analysis, incident response assistance, cybersecurity awareness and training programs, and professional development for technical and other staff. Learn more about the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at uwo.sh slash cybersecurity. That's uwo.sh slash cybersecurity. Well, A, leadership is all about people. One of the things that I, I, I tell my students when we, when we talk about leadership and getting things done is, is I have them recognize most of the time you are not going to be in a situation where you can say, we're doing this or else, right? You can't say, do this or you're fired or do this or I cut your funding. But yet you still have to accomplish the thing you've been asked to accomplish. And oftentimes you have to get people who have otherwise greater power in the organization to do the thing you need them to do, right? How can I go to Provost Coker and get him to do the thing I need him to do when he can be like, whatever, you're, right. you're nobody. Go away. Go away. <laughs> um, and, and so if you're not forming relationships and you're not understanding what is important to them, you can't get them to do anything. And even if you have the best idea, if you don't have followers, you're not a leader. By definition, you have to have followers, <laughs> right? If you're flying over the desert and you look out the window and you see some guy wandering through the desert by himself, you don't go, that's a great leader, right? <laughs> they know something nobody else does and look at them go. <laughs> um, and yet, if you saw someone wandering through the desert with a whole bunch of followers, you might think, that's a great leader to get all these people to follow him through the desert. Something's that's, going on. That, something's going on. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's really about understanding people's motivations, understanding in advance what the obstacles are going to be. Um, whether you agree with those, whether or not those should be obstacles, the obstacles are real, real nonetheless. Uh, and, and so working with people, bringing them in, making them part of the solution, making them winners in this situation goes a long way to getting them to advocate for, for your point or getting to where you want to be. It sounds like you focus much more on informal leadership as opposed to formal authority as a way to get things done. Yeah. You think that's made you a better leader? Um, I hope so. Um, you know, because most of us don't have formal authority, <laughs> right? Yes. So, so, so we have to do something else. Uh, when you get formal authority, that informal stuff still works great. Um, it's an and, not an or. It's an and, not an or, exactly. Uh, I have found <laughs> when I have had reports who like me, they like me because I, in, I do all that informal stuff, right? I involve them. Uh, one, of the, one of the best pieces of advice that I tell all upcoming leaders who are going to have the beginning of some formal authority uh, deals with how you run a meeting. And, and this may have even been in your class, so I, I, I hope it is. We Take do, credit for it regardless. We, we go back a ways. We go back a ways. Um, that when you have a meeting, everything on your agenda, and you should have an agenda, um, will have one of four letters next to it, A, B, C, or D. If something has an A, this is an autocratic decision, right? I'm just telling you what's going on. The decision has been made. You have nothing to say about it. This isn't up for debate. Get this is line. what it is. 
B, there's a decision to be made and I have a bias. I think I know what I want to do and I will listen to your input, but I'm leaning in a particular direction. And you're upfront about that. And I'm upfront about it. C, uh, I am consulting with you. A decision needs to be made. I don't have a particular way to go. You have some significant influence in what we're going to do with this decision. Or D, this is discussion only. The decision's not being made. I'm just putting it out there so we can further this situation. And even when decisions are unpopular, if people know how much authority they have in getting that decision made, the buy-in is better. I may not like what's going on, but if I know I wasn't going to be listened to anyway, okay, fine, here's the decision and we're going with it. Right. Where I have found the biggest problems come is when people think they have some input, when people think that you want to know what they think and why they think I it. think you're consulting and you ain't, you're just explaining. Exactly. That, that is where a lot of the, the displeasure comes. Well, you're not listening to me anyway. Well, sometimes I'm not, and I'm going to tell you I'm not up front. But when you, when you think I'm listening to you, I better be listening to you. And I better have a reason for, if I didn't go with something you said, why that was. So if I'm not going to be listening to you, I'm up front about that. Up front, right. And if I'm telling you I'm going to listen to you, by gosh, I really need to listen. Absolutely. Don't necessarily have to do what you want. Exactly, right. I'm not giving you the decision power. But I'm making it clear I'm going to listen, and I'm going to make sure you're heard. And then explain why I made potentially another decision. Yep. And if yeah, I think if you're smart, give credit. If, if I do go with something that you said, give credit to the fact that you helped steer me in that way. Right. Recognize that I really am listening. I, you said this. I heard it. And that's part of why we're doing what we're doing. And we're giving credit as we pass this thing up the food chain. This isn't me. No. But it's I, I had the sexual partner. I had these people. I had those people. All these people helped make it happen. Yep. Sounds Absolutely. good. Let's shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. Data security. I, I'm a leader in an organization. Why, why should I care about data security? Uh, my guess is everything in your business is now data, whether it's the accounting system from which you pay the checks and keep the books, whether the order system where you're taking the orders in, the manufacturing system, everything has inventory, been- Inventory, you inventory, name it. Inventory, almost everything has been digitized to this point. As a result, uh, just as you would want to protect people from walking into your factory and walking out with machinery or product, you should want to protect the data and the inputs that allow for that product to be, to be made, et cetera. Uh, on top of that, you also have some existential data, right? We exist in a digital plane almost as much, and I think in certain situations more than we exist in a physical plane. If you are declared dead digitally, even though you can physically go up to someone and show them that you're not, try to try to convince the rest of the system that you're not. <laughs> Good luck. It will take you months, if not years. Um, so, so all of this stuff that has been digitized are, are assets that we need to protect in the same way that we protect our raw materials, the products we sell, uh, anything else. Uh, the, the problem is it's a whole lot harder to see it walk out the door. Because it doesn't have to walk out the door and walk out a wire. Right. Or, 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 or I could just make a copy of it. And you don't know I have it in. And, and you still have yours, and that's fine. And then suddenly you see it on WikiLeaks or whatever the case may be, and, and, and now it's out there. Okay. So I understand now why it's important as a leader that I, I am aware of this question of data security. What do I need to know about data security? As opposed to, I have people who know about this stuff. Right. Um, you need to know that primarily cybersecurity is a cultural problem, not a technological problem. Yes, we have digitized and, and we have networks and firewalls and, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but in the age of social engineering, in the age of spam email with links, uh, you know, anybody in your system can receive an email that has a bad link in it, right? It purports to be a video to a, a cat falling out of a tree and ho oh, ho, that's cute. And you know how it lands on a duck and I don't know, but you know, it's, it, it's something that seems- I did miss that one, You did miss on. that one? Uh, it, it seems benign on its face, but it may have introduced some malware into your system or uh, you know, someone calls the front desk, I'm working with so-and-so, uh, I can't get a hold of them, can you give me your number, right? And they, they share information that you don't otherwise want shared. They may not be the target. They may simply be the foothold into the rest of the system. Because one of the things that bad actors do 
is, is they then move laterally and they escalate their privileges. So I may get into the system with the privileges of someone who appears to have no power or no authority to get to anything. But if I can then appear to be them and leverage the personal relationships they've already had and send out an email as them that says, hey, you know, um, uh, you know I, I know you're trying to get to this thing and I know you've got access uh, to it, but but aren't there? Let me get into it for you and share your username and password with me, or you know what whatever right. sort of social psychological manipulation they're going to use. Um, th this is how most of the time the bad actors get to where they want to be. That that the the cinematic view, the brute force attack of the guy sitting in the basement hacking away on a keyboard, and suddenly in thirty seconds is into the CIA. Not real. These people generally take the long view of what they want to get to. And fundamentally, your technology may not detect them until they've gotten to an escalation point where now they're really starting to get stuff, at which point they've been in your system for a really long time and may have hidden other places and, and you think you've gotten rid of them and now you haven't. And um, you know, mo most, most bad actors are in, uh, are in the system six months before you even see them. So it sounds similar to what I hear about leadership, that when you're thinking about who to promote in leadership, it's more the people skills than it is the tech side. Yep. And if I'm worried about data security, yeah, I got to have my tech right. But it's the doggone people that are causing the problem. They're, they're, they're leaving the door unlocked and letting the criminals walk right in. Or holding no the door No matter how good them. a lock you have. Doesn't matter how good a lock you have. If they're holding the door open for them, they're in. Okay. And as a... And as a person in an organization who's not in cybersecurity, I need to understand that right? so that I know what I need to be doing, et cetera. All right. Next question. How do I know if my cybersecurity folks are any good? I don't know squat about cybersecurity. How, how would I know if my people are doing the right stuff or we're just amazingly exposed? Sure. Um, Let's, let's be honest about this. Many times you can't, right? Just as you don't know if your doctor's any good until you need surgery and suddenly you're missing a leg, um, it's sometimes hard to do that. One thing you can do, just as with your doctor, is get recommendations from the outside. Who do they know? Who do they talk to? Who respects them, right? Send some feelers out in the community um, from people who you at least think are doing a good job. And, and do they know this person? And, well, I've heard this, and they're doing these things. Does that make sense? So you're looking at the reputation, reputation that helps. your data security folks yep. have in the industry. Yep. There are also some more concrete things. Uh, do they have certain industry certifications? Uh, uh, you know, CISSP is one that is, that is rather robust. So if someone comes with a CISSP certification, not only have they passed exams that say, I know these things, but they also have a certain level of practical experience that is required okay. as part of the CISSP. So you're hiring somebody in, having that certification would be yep. a gold star of some level. Yep. The other thing that I would emphasize, and, and I would say this with any uh, technician, can they explain to you what they're doing in plain English? Can they show you what they're doing so that it's not just this theoretical thing? Oh, yeah, we, we have a firewall. Well, what's a firewall? We'll explain what that is. Show, show me what you're blocking and, and, and how you're blocking it. And, and then have external auditors come in and test it, right? Uh, because A, nobody's perfect. You could have the best cybersecurity person in the world. They will miss something. Um, so, so have external people come in, and this is the thing I thought I was protecting and the level to which I was protecting it. Is it that way? You can hire white hat hackers to hack into your system. Um, uh, they're sometimes called penetration testers, right? Did they get through the system? And maybe you want to give them a target, right? Can, can you tell me who my largest customer is? Uh, and, and so if they can get into that system and give you that information and maybe even tell you what sales you had with them last year and... and some information you were looking at, but but give them parameters. Don't just say, hey, t tell me where all my vulnerabilities are. Oh my goodness, we could spend forever forever doing that. And and frankly, have them access some things that you don't want them to access. Okay. Um, so, so check the reputation, see if there are any third party authorities that can validate and, and then do some pen testing, uh, do hire some people to do some white hat hacking. And if your internal people say, well, we can do that, they, maybe they can, 
But that's also like uh, telling your locksmith or having your locksmith say, no, no, I, I know the doors are locked because I locked them. You know, well, did you install all the locks you needed to lock? And did you get that right? You want someone else who, to verify it. Who, who doesn't have skin in the game to say, yep, that is indeed the case. And, and a good cybersecurity practitioner will recognize that this is a good thing, right? If, if they're only worried about covering their butts, that's always a red flag for me. So the, the data security person who says, look, I want us to go get an external person to, to test, to stress test the system. Absolutely. That's a, a gold star that's to a check. That's a good sign. And the flip side, if they say, oh, no, 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 we don't need anybody else to test this. Trust me. I, I got it. Put me in, coach. I got everything covered. Yeah. That's going to make you nervous. That would make me very nervous. Cool. Sounds interesting. What else should business leaders know, if anything, about data security as they're moving forward? Um, th this is not going to be less of a problem in your lives. This is only going to be more. Uh, and, and so you shouldn't be looking at this as a problem that can be solved. This, this, this is a chronic condition. Uh, you're going to have to keep um, working at this, not only because the technology itself is going to change, but the bad actors' tactics change. I would also remind people that while most of the successful breaches come from the outside, the size of the successful breaches from the inside is significantly greater. Ah. So, so I might be externally hacked more frequently than I have someone who steals from me, but the person who steals from me is going to steal a whole lot more than the person who's coming in from the outside. And so it's not just enough to face outward and stop those attacks because you could be getting fleeced from behind. You need to take a look at everything that's going on and don't assume that anything is okay. Uh, one of the things that throws off my undergrads is I say, who is the most dangerous actor uh, that you need to defend against? And they're always like, you know, government, uh, you know, criminals in Russia or whatever the case may be. It's like, nope, you're CEO. And they're like, aren't they in charge of actually keeping the company going? I said, yes, but I'm not talking about the person, the CEO. I'm talking about the role, the CEO. Because most people, if they get an email from the CEO, <laughs> hairs stand up on the right, back of the head, right. oh my God, I got to do something. If that's not actually coming from the CEO, if they're asking you to do something you're not going to otherwise do, you're playing right into their hands, right? I don't have to distrust Dale Feinauer, the CEO. I need to be critical and um, careful of the CEO, regardless of the person. Who may not be the actual who CEO, may not be the actual person. but it's the person who's worked their way up the food chain to act like. Because, because most, engine, most attacks involve some level of social engineering, and the whole goal of social engineering is to get you to react rather than to respond. Right? They're going to send you something that has some sort of a threat, some sort of an urgency, something that gets you to stop thinking and just do, reacting. As opposed, as opposed to, to, wait a minute, this is my third day on the job. Why is the CEO emailing me? This doesn't make sense. <laughs> right? It, I mean, most of these things, if you take 30 seconds to, to take a breath and go, wait a minute, um, you, you can see through them fairly easily, regardless of how well they're written. The last thing I would ask anybody to remember about cybersecurity, we all will fail it at some points. We have to be right every single time. The bad guy only has to be right once. And so the odds of us being right every single time, uh, I know you are perfect, Dale, <laughs> but I am not. Um, so, and apparently you're not real bright either. And I'm not real bright either. So, so, so when one is breached and one will be breached at some point, that is not an indictment of your cybersecurity people. That is not an indictment of the of the person who held the door open while the criminal walked in. That is an opportunity for education and an opportunity to get better. And it may not feel like that when you know <laughs> you you just wired half a million dollars to somewhere in Russia or China or whatever the case may be, but that's the reality of the situation. This is an opportunity for you to get better, and provided it doesn't close your doors. Um, You'll, you'll live through it. And if it closed your doors, it doesn't matter who you're going to fire because you're all out of business anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> so if you're going to have to pay the two, if you're going to have to pay the tuition, might as well figure out how to learn the lesson. Learn the lesson and 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 spend the investment up front. For every you know dollar you spend in training, that is worth ten dollars in investment in technology. Finally, um, Center for Cybersecurity Excellence. Let's yep. assume I'm being listening to this podcast and think, oh, that, that's some good stuff. Yep. This guy seems like he may be reasonably bright, if not perfect. Um, maybe I should contact those folks and see if they could help my organization. How would they get in touch with you? We've made it really difficult. We have an email, ccoe at uwosh.edu. ccoe at uwosh.edu. Yep. Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, ccoe at uwosh.edu. All right. Very good. Well, Michael, thank you for coming in and sharing some time with us. And hopefully we'll be good at not opening that door. That's right. And letting people in. That's right. I'll, Thanks a lot. Dale. I'll try to make sure I react, not respond. And if you do, it's okay. Or respond, not react. You want to respond, not react. And if you do, that's okay. But let people know so that they can start taking Cleaning measures. up the mess that I Cleaning made. Cleaning up the mess. Exactly. Well, I'm good at getting people to clean up the messes I made. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Dale. Very good. It's Time is a production of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business Graduate Programs in association with Venture Project Studios. Executive producer, Aaron J. Armstrong. Host, Professor Dale Feinauer. Creative director, Madison Potratz. Director of photography, Elizer Klune. Audio and video editor, Elizer Klune. Marketing strategy, Tara Larson. Social media, Anwar Mahana. A special thanks to L Creative, Top View Media, Michael Patton, and the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs.